Welcome to the penultimate session of 10 questions, Reckoning. Tonight we ask, what is love? A question that has been asked and mulled over for millennia and for which there are infinite answers. To me, it seems a particularly important question for us right now a time when so many are struggling on so many different levels in our homes and in our communities near and far. It's at this time of the year here in the Northern Hemisphere that the days are waning. And like our global ancestors, when the darkness and cold come, we turn to warmth and light for our very survival. It's at this time that we look forward with hope to days that will get longer and lighter, just as now we look forward to the days when the pandemic will cease, that justice will grow, and to borrow the words of Michael Esselin, UCLA's oncology chaplain and our extraordinary guest last week, that the future will once again be a frequent guest at our tables. Let us invite the future with love as we also acknowledge our deep roots in the past. And speaking of the past, last year in our centennial edition of 10 Questions, Massimo Ciovalela, UCLA scholar of Italian and medieval literature explained to us that the ancient Greeks, Sappho and Homer described love through its bodily presence, through flesh, pulse, heat, sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. A 16th century medical book representing the brain revealed the belief that when a person becomes obsessed with love, it was because the image of the love object or the person had gotten stuck, literally freezing in the brain. Therefore, a cure for love involved heating the brain from the outside think like heated tongs and other medical instruments in order to soften it and thereby unstick a passionate obsession. Thankfully, this is not the way most of us concept conceptualize love these days. But love is not a science or a fact. Rather, perhaps it's a set of ideas to which we turn in order to explain not only a universe of feelings, but also a reason for life. But speaking from my own experience and without any scientific evidence, love was most often confused for me with desire and with longing. And by that, I mean an unattained but hopeful possibility that I would become whole by finding my partner in life. It took me a long, long time to learn whatever it is I know right now about love because I was always looking to be loved. It finally occurred to me that love actually works the other way around. If I stopped waiting for love to find me, I could start activating my love for others. And in doing so, I began to understand just how dangerous this business of love is because it asks us to be fully present, to be vulnerable, to be tender, and to be just, even when it feels impossible to be so. And once another person's well being is intrinsically connected to your own, then there is always the possibility of loss, profound loss. But complicate this notion of love with the following. We live in a capitalist market-driven society that has historically all too often co-opted love or some dominant heteronormative notion of what love is or should be to compel us toward a longing or desire for things, whether it be a car, a cologne, or a pair of jeans, the marketplace produces need, your need, through the promise of love and desirability. Far too many of us are manipulated and shaped by these pervasive narratives and the beliefs and values that come with them. In that, without even recognizing it, 
our desire to be loved brings us into an encounter with a set of systemic beliefs often tied to whiteness, ableism, patriarchy, and heteronormativity. Insidious in that, in my opinion, is the way love as a set of ideas remains unquestioned, naturalized as part of our collective human experience, all the while subliminally maintaining these limiting constructions of identity and regimes of power. But what of the many of us here and everywhere whose life experience does not subscribe to these normative values? How are different ideas about love circulated? Might love be the wellspring from which the movements for liberation and justice emerge and grow? I can't help but again be reminded of the following quote from Cornel West, justice is what lo love looks like in public. Just as tenderness is what love feels like in private. Perhaps the love that we need more abundantly than ever right now is not the kind of love bent on self-fulfillment or satisfying personal need or managing ennui, but rather the love that gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of togetherness, a sense of belonging. Perhaps it is a love that is grounded in action, a love that tends to the well being of others, that tends to the well being of the planet and all life, that seeks justice and through which we behold beauty and wonder. For those who are joining us for the first time, 10 Questions is a course offered by UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture and simultaneously a public platform for thoughtful engagement with our extended community. We're here together because of our shared resourcefulness, resilience, and extraordinary adaptability. Again, welcome. And it's here with you that 10 Questions brings together the resources of the university to build capacity and community in this time of challenge and need. The format for this evening will include a 10 minute presentation from each of our panelists, followed by a discussion amongst them. Our students will then immediately gather in small group discussions in Zoom breakout rooms, and everyone else will remain here in the webinar for a very special presentation by students from John Marshall High School who have created their own musical responses to tonight's question. After that, We'll welcome our students back and finish out the evening with a Q&A with our esteemed guests. So, our first panelist tonight is Tyrone Howard. Dr. Howard is a professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA, whose research focuses on race and equity in education. He's the inaugural director of the new UCLA Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families, a transdisciplinary consortium of experts who examine academic, mental health, and social emotional experiences and challenges for California's most vulnerable youth populations. He's also the director of the UCLA Transformation of Schools, a research and policy center that serves as a thought partner for districts, counties, and states to pr pursue whole child, whole community approaches to school systems improvement. It's amazing that with all of that, he could be here with us tonight. Welcome Tyrone. Thank you so much, Vic. It's my honor and my privilege to be here with you all this evening. Uh, I think that this topic is so much needed at this point in time, I wanna thank uh, the School of Arts and Architecture for the 10 questions format. I think this is something that should be mandatory for everyone who's a part of our UCLA community. I think there are poignant questions being asked, important issues that are being discussed, and I'm just honored and humbled to be a part of what I think is arguably the most important of the 10 questions that you all have been examining this quarter, which is love. I raise this because I think that over the past several weeks, months, years, that Issues such as justice has gotten love, peace has gotten its share of love, 
equity and diversity has gotten its share of love. Diversity has gotten its share of love and struggle has gotten its share of love. But I wanna evoke one of my favorite artists, Stevie Wonder, when he says that love is in need of love. So as I prepare my brief comments to start us off today, I'm going to have as a backdrop, one of my favorite songs, which is Stevie Wonder's Love is in Need of Love Today. I use this as I start my conversation because I think that love encompasses a number of core concepts and ideas. I think love is complicated. It's not easy. It's full of challenges, setbacks, and pitfalls. Love is full of ups and downs, highs and lows. Whoever says that love is easy has never loved before. Whoever said love is simple has not loved hard. So if you're going to love, it requires thick skin. It requires short memories because love is complicated, because love is complex. Love has lots of layers. So understand the complication that is love. I would also ask that we think about the fact that love is forgiving. Because let us be clear, with love, there will be heartache, there will be setbacks, there will be disappointments, there will be failures. But the love that is forgiving is a love that says we all are imperfect individuals and we see the best, we see the promise, we see the potential, we see the possibilities of what each of us possesses as human beings. So you can't love if you can't forgive. Love doesn't hold on. Love doesn't begrudge eternally. Love forgives. Love doesn't necessarily forget, but it forgives in ways that sees the best, that sees the promise, that sees the hope, that sees the potential, and sees all that is good, all that is loving, all that is possible. So please understand for those who want to love that there's got to be a forgiving heart that recognizes that as much as we try, at times we fall short. As much as we try, sometimes we don't miss we don't hit the mark. Understanding that love is about forgiving and forgiving is about love. I would also add, love at its best is unconditional, meaning that we don't love only when those people give us what we need on certain terms. Love is unconditional because it sees our shortcomings, it sees our human frailties. Love at its best is unconditional because it says that no matter how much we struggle and our best to be the best humans we can be, that we recognize that love is still, still going to be unconditional. Unconditional positive regard is what love is, which says that I see you, I hear you, I feel you, I respect you, I honor you, I share with you. Love at its best is unconditional, that no matter how difficult, no matter how trying, no matter how tested we get, I'm there for you, I'm there with you. I'm there side by side with you because this love is unconditional, it's unyielding, it's unapologetic, and it sees no boundaries. So if you really wanna love and love with every fiber of your being and love without giving up and love without contingencies and love without associations or without any kinds of strings attached, love at its absolute best is unconditional in all that it has to offer. I would also add love is caring and sharing because when I talk about love being caring, I'm not talking about caring in the hokey way or caring in the superficial way or caring in the play nice way. I'm talking about deep radical care, care that you see yourself reflected in other individuals, care that says that I will do whatever I've got to do to be there for you. Care says that when you hurt, I hurt. Care says that when you are in pain, I'm in pain. Care says that when you're sad, I'm sad. Caring that says that I try to feel every possible human emotion that you have. But caring is also tied to sharing. And love is sharing because love means that if you go without, I'm prepared to go without. Love means that if you've only got one thing left, that I've only got one thing left. Love is sharing because for those who have loved and loved hard, you know that you have to give your last oftentimes to those who need it more. Love is sharing because you feel satisfaction in giving others something that you may not have. Love is sharing because again, at the end of the day, we are only as good as we can be in concert with others who mean the most to us. So let us be clear about the fact that love is caring and sharing, but not just in the I say because it sounds nice and it sounds really chic, but in a real radical, 
deep-seated, hard way that you're willing to love that shows that care is the embodiment of who we are. That love is about sharing what you have is mine and what I have is yours. And what we have is collectively what we have to be the best we can be. Love is caring. Love is caring hard. Love is caring like you can't care any harder. But love is also sharing. Because I think about sharing, I also think about the fact that love is selfless. Love is selfless. Love means that I don't have to worry about my concerns, my needs and my wants, because if you love me, I know they'll be taken care of. Because my responsibility, my duty, my job is to make sure that your needs, wants, thoughts and concerns are going to be taken care of. So it's selfless. It doesn't think about what I need. It rarely says me. It really says I. Love operates from the standpoint of saying, what is it that we need? How can the collaborative understand that we are better when we are thinking about us instead of I? That it's me that's not the center, but it's we that's the center. Love is selfless because you are prepared to go without. Love is selfless because you're prepared to go for broke. Love is selfless because you know at the end of the day, if I don't think about my needs, somebody has my back. Love is selfless because it recognizes that if I ever have a need or want that has to be fulfilled, there's someone who recognizes that and is willing to give what they have, even if it's their last, no matter how hard it might be, because at the end of the day, love is selfless in all that it has to offer. And as we talk about this, I'd also say, love is hard work. Let me stress this point. Nothing in life that's worth having does not come without significant, significant hard work. You've gotta be prepared to roll up your sleeves, to get dirty, to get in the trenches, to put in the time, to put in the effort, to sacrifice, to do the things that are oftentimes undoable, to think the things that are oftentimes unthinkable, to say the things that are oftentimes not spoken. Love is hard work because it is that valuable. It's that important because if it were easy, then we'd have far more of it. We have to be willing to put in the work to make love feel the love that it deserves and needs. Love is hard work, not just some of the time. Love is not just hard work every other day. Love is hard work every day that we wake up and we take another breath and that we inhale the air around us, that we take another step. It's hard work in all that we do. So never think that this is something that you can just do half-heartedly. Never think that you can do this in just a real sort of, sort of careless kind of way. It requires every fiber of our being, all of our DNA to work hard at it every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. I will also say that love is timeless because we share memories, we share experiences, and even when our physical time comes to an end, those memories stay with us for a lifetime and beyond. Love is not bound by the 24 hours in a day. Love is not bound by the seven days in a week. Love is timeless, it's endless. It's ongoing, it's enduring because at the end of the day, love is what keeps us fulfilled. It's what keeps us going It's what gives us purpose. Love is timeless because many of us are here today because we stand on the shoulders of those individuals who prayed, who hoped and wished and wanted that one day we could have something better than they had. And that's why love is timeless because we have an indebted amount of gratitude for those who came before us to create the possibilities that we all enjoy today. What does love mean for me? Love is also struggle and protest. It means that you've got to recognize that that which you care for, that which you share for, that which you love deeply requires struggle and deep-seated protest in the face of injustice. We also have to recognize that love is also the very thing that, that Vic talked about. Cornel West says justice is what love looks like in public. So if you want to see what it looks like, it's justice. It's justice. It's justice. Love is in need of love because love is what justice looks like in public. We also want to know, for me, love is also faith, the belief in something higher than me, something bigger than myself, the hope in the unseen. Love is rooted in a deep sense of faith, a deep sense of a higher being, a deep sense in a creator that helps to create all that we see around us. It's deeply rooted in faith. For me, love is also deeply rooted in family, where you're willing to go to no ends of the earth for those people who you care the deepest about, where you're willing to 
to give your last. You're willing to go without sleep, without food, without water, without your basic necessities. You are willing to lay your life on the line for those who are closer to you. That's what love is. I would also say that love for me is about teaching because teaching brings me joy. Teaching brings me satisfaction. Teaching brings me love because love is about helping to enhance. It's about helping to improve. It's about helping to increase the ways in which we understand the world around us and to be able to critique the world, to improve the world. And as I prepare to close, I think about the fact that teaching is also for me about listening and learning. My great grandmother always said there's a reason why you have two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much as you speak. So in listening comes learning. That is what love is. Listening and learning, growing and thinking, recognizing that we are far from perfect, that we are so, so, so far short of where we can be and where we can be and where we will be. It's listening and learning. I will also say that love at the end of the day is worth it. It's worth it because it gives us meaning. It gives us purpose. Love liberates. Love conquers hate. Love humanizes and love unifies us. Love synthesizes us. Love gives us meaning. Love gives us purpose. Love gives us life. Love is in need of love today. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Tyrone. Uh, love is what we need today. That's so very clear. And yet it's, you know, you, you can't hold it in your hands. It's, it's, you have to believe in its power and, um, and then you change the things around you, change the people around you. Thank you so much for introducing love this evening. And um, I'm gonna make a shift. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Alicia Gaspar de Alba, a native of El Paso Juarez border. Professor Gaspar de Alba is a celebrated writer, scholar, and activist who uses poetry, prose, and theory for social change. A founding faculty member and former chair of the UCLA Cesar E. Chavez Department of Chicana Chicano Studies, now known as the Department of Chicano, Chicana and Central American Studies. Gaspar de Alba's work explores gender and sexuality, Chicano, Chicana art, popular culture, and border studies. Known to her students as La Profe, or Gaspar, she is also a professor of English and gender studies and previously served as the chair of LGBTQ studies at UCLA. Once again, someone who probably doesn't have a hell of a lot of free time. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to be on this panel and also for uh, you know, having me uh, really take some time to think about this question. Uh, love is a is a for me a, is revolutionary, uh, in the sense uh, of the way that Che Guevara used it. Like every true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love, and as you were saying in my bio, social justice is what motivates my teaching and my research and my life in general. Uh, but with this particular question, um, I wanted to get a little bit more intimate. And this is the first time I've ever read this piece out loud. It's an excerpt from my uh, memoir in progress. Uh, and I thought that it would fit the question uh, as one of my answers for what is love uh, in my life, it, that it would fit the question very, very beautifully, I think, um, but you can let me know afterward. Uh, it's called Love in the Foster System. Who knew? that after 33 years of living a dedicated lesbian life, this old butch would one day fall in love with a boy, a seven month old boy that is named after a medieval knight and like a knight bearing the wounds, scars and bruises of broken bones and other battles. In his young life, this little boy jousted with bronchitis, pneumonia, 
asthma, acid reflux, malnutrition, monthly emergency room visits, bottle rot on his new little teeth, and a fracture on his thigh bone that the birth mother knew nothing about. He was diagnosed with failure to thrive, hydrocephaly, and neuroblastoma, a form of cancer that presents with bruises on the face, oozing eyes, and developmental delays. At Children's Hospital in Hollywood, where my wife Alma and I went to visit him for the first time, he was in the Children's Oncology Ward and had quickly become the little champion of all the nurses in that station. Paraded around the ward on the arm of one nurse or another, everyone knew Tristan. We were told he was Caucasian because the birth mom is Caucasian. So when we first saw him in the hallway, hanging out with Nurse Cassie, we were surprised to see a pale, but most definitely biracial child smiling wanly up at us, hunched over in, his, in her arms in his little green hospital gown. He looked like a smiling version of Yoda with tight curly hair, same frog-shaped head, greenish skin, and wise old eyes. For me, that was the moment I fell in love. Let me back up a little and explain that Alma and I are licensed foster parents in the Foster Adopt program of the Department of Children's and Family Services in Los Angeles. At the beginning of 2012, we decided to adopt a child through the foster system. It was a huge decision and secretly we both harbored serious doubts about becoming parents, about the children in the system whom we'd been told over and over were all damaged in some way and especially about the impact that bringing a troubled child, child into our lives was going to make on our happy marriage and busy careers. Determined to create a family together, despite our silent worries, we set off every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. for the Los Angeles Trade Tech College in Hollywood, where we took our six Saturdays worth of PS Map classes learned all about the psychology of abused, neglected, and abandoned kids, role played as parents getting a child removed or as the child getting taken away from her parents, and listened to candid presentations from other foster parents meant, I am sure, to frighten off the weak of heart. And finally, we graduated from the course along with about 15 other families. But this was only the first step in getting our license. Before we could be placed on any call lists, we still had to comply with the other steps in the process. Some of the information they required from us felt like classic invasion of privacy, our bank account numbers and balances, a clean bill of health certified by our primary care doctor, reference letters from friends and relatives who could vouch for our character and our ability to raise a family. We even got fingerprinted and had our prints checked by the Department of Justice to verify we had no felonies to our name. With all of that behind us, the only thing left before we could receive our foster resource parents license was the big one, the home study. Talk about invasion of privacy. With clipboard in hand, the social worker opened every drawer and cabinet, looked into our refrigerator and pantry, ran the hot water in all the sinks and tubs to make sure we had heat and inspected the house for any structural or living dangers. Because we lived in a condo and one of our bedrooms was our studio and library, we could only accommodate an infant aged zero to two whose room or space could be in the master bedroom. To prepare for the home study, we baby-proofed our home, set up the crib and the changing table and an armoire for baby's things. We bought a fire extinguisher, a diaper bag, baby clothes of different sizes, toys and blankets. We installed a car seat and even had different kinds of baby food on the counter since we didn't know what age the child coming into our home would be. At last, nine months later, we were done with the red tape. Our license got mailed to us and now all we had to do was pray for the match to happen and wait for the social worker's call. Like all parents adopting from the foster care system, we wanted a healthy baby, preferably a girl, 
with no trauma or medical issues, and a newborn if possible, such as a safe surrender child whose biological mother had responsibly delivered the baby to the right authorities and terminated her parental rights on the spot. That's not too much to ask, is it? We were told the waiting list on those types of infants was three years minimum, and parents were selected by seniority. So we resigned ourselves to a long wait and plunged back into our work and lives until such times the universe brought the perfect baby girl that was meant to be ours into our life. It was a whole year after our license came through that we got the call, not for the perfect newborn girl we had requested, but for a seven month old boy who had been detained by DCFS because of severe neglect and physical abuse. The social worker who called us at 6.03 p.m. that Friday evening in mid-July was not the same one we had taken the training classes with and who was holding off calling us until he found a good match with the type of baby we had requested. I guess Mario, our social worker, had taken the day off and this other social worker in his office named Rebecca had found our name in the system. It was the end of the day, the end of the week, and DCFS needed to find a home for this child right away because he was about to be released from Children's Hospital on Monday morning. Rebecca gave us some of the details of this baby boy's case. That he'd been brought into the hospital with black eyes, bruises on his face and pneumonia. And that a skeletal x-ray had revealed a compressed spine and a fracture in his upper leg that had already healed. It sounded like he had been sustaining physical abuse for some time. We told her we didn't really feel qualified to deal with a child with medical issues. She completely understood, she said, but she invited us to go and visit him and talk to his doctors. He's a very sweet baby boy, she insisted. And the damage was so severe, the judge told the birth mom at the hearing that she was probably not going to recommend reunification for the child. Does that mean the judge terminated the parental rights, I asked? Not yet, but I've seen this kind of situation before where there is excessive abuse and the child gets to stay with their foster parents. Of course, that wasn't true, but I didn't know that at the time. To me, it made perfect sense that a judge would take away a parent's rights due to the severe damage inflicted on their child. As we would soon learn, however, logic plays a small to non-existent role in the foster system. I wasn't afraid of the medical stuff either because it sounded like the issues were a consequence of mistreatment, not permanent conditions that we would have to be dealing with the rest of his life. A fact that we confirmed when we spoke to one of his doctors the next day. But my wife wasn't so sure. She didn't trust that the social worker was telling us the whole story. Still, she went with me to Children's Hospital the next day and came face to face with that little Yoda baby who would be our son for 15 months the little boy I fell in love with on the spot. Indeed, his doctors told us that although they had suspected neuroblastoma because of all the bruising on his face and the oozing eyes, the million dollar workup they had given him ruled out any sign of cancer. The fracture on his right thigh was an old wound and had already healed and did not impinge on his use of his leg at all. But they had also ruled out that the fracture and the bruises on his face were a consequence of a medical condition. Euphemistically referred to as non-accidental trauma, these were the evidence of severe physical abuse. His asthma and acid reflux were being treated with medications that we had to give him twice a day, every day. As his foster parents, we would be required to undergo a special training right there in the hospital to learn how to administer the meds before we could take him home. For that first visit, we took him a toy frog rattle that he took right away, and he came easily into our arms, smiling and playing with his new rattle as though he'd known us his whole little life. We took turns holding him, even though I was in the middle of a fibromyalgia flare-up that shot sharp pains from my lower back down to my feet. But I just couldn't resist holding this wounded little boy, who was surprisingly heavy for as skinny as he was. We stayed with him about three hours that Saturday, playing with him, taking pictures, talking to his doctors. Although he couldn't crawl or sit up, he did know how to hold his own bottle. He'd been doing that 
for a long time. We made a disastrous first diaper change, putting the diaper on backwards. He cried loudly at our fumbling hands, but the nurses told us he hated getting his diaper changed and he hated baths too. That night at home, we talked about the possibility of bringing Tristan into our lives. Could we really manage the care of this sickly little boy? Could we change our routine so dramatically and so suddenly? Did we even want to go through with this whole fast adopt thing, especially when he wasn't a safe surrender child and might be given back to his biological mother? Even though there was clear cut evidence of abuse, it was inculcated into our brains in our PS map class that the court will always favor reunification with the blood family and that there was no guarantee that we would be able to adopt the child we were fostering. In fact, our primary job as foster parents was to care for the child until the parent could get their act together to facilitate that reunification. It would be too hard on us, we decided, to give Tristan back to such an abusive parent. We would have to pass and take our chance on waiting another year to get the call again. By the next night though, we had changed our minds. On Monday morning, we trekked back to Children's Hospital, watched our training video about how to administer asthma inhaler medication through a mask that we had to fit over the baby's face, how to measure out the omeprazole liquid in the syringe and make sure it got down the baby's esophagus, how to mash up antibiotic tablets and mix the powder with applesauce or something sweet. After our training, we met with Rebecca one last time and signed her stack of forms and triplicate that made us the official foster family of baby Tristan. We changed him into the navy blue onesie we had brought with us. Good thing Alma thought to take that as the only clothing the nurses had for him was his green hospital gown. Gathered up the few belongings he had acquired in the hospital, the bottles of Prosobi formula, a few diapers, three donated toys, and a hand knitted square also donated. The only thing he had from home was a brown and green nursery blanket that we thought we should take with us as well. The car seat that they had brought him into the hospital with, we did not want. And Rebecca took it to return to the biological mother, who by the way, also requested that we return the nursery blanket. At his departure, the nurses of section 4E in the children's oncology ward gathered to say goodbye to their favorite patient and several of them cried. We took pictures with them for his life book. Nurse Cassie took a picture of the three of us and we walked out with our foster son in Alma's arms. My inflamed sciatic nerve wrenching my glutes at every step but the smile of a new parent wide on my face. We loaded him into his new car seat and drove home a family, listening to him playing peacefully with his rattle. That first night was a disaster. He was fine on the ride home and he stayed put on the fleece blanket we laid out for him in the living room, <clears throat> excuse me, while we steamed yams for his dinner. The cats were as fascinated by him as he was enthralled by their curious faces pressing cold noses into his arms and legs sniffing out this new member of our household. Hungrily, he ate his dinner and devoured the yogurt into which we had stirred one of his crushed antibiotic tablets. I read him a story and his eyes started to droop. We thought things were moving smoothly, that he was no trouble at all. But he started to fuss when we bathed him in the kitchen sink. He did not like the water at all, but it was important to wash him down and get all the hospital germs off. He brightened up when we took him into the bedroom and lathered baby lotion on his dry skin, diapered him and dressed him in one of the new Wonder Woman PJs we have bought. But when we placed the syringe of bitter omeprazole into his mouth, he looked at us like we had just betrayed his trust. He squirmed and spit and tightened his throat. Twisting his head from side to side, he refused to let us put on the mask by which he would get his asthma treatment. We gave up that on that after a few tries as his anguished screams were getting so loud, we were sure a neighbor was going to report us to DCFS. By the time Alma swaddled him and put him in his crib, he was all out bawling and coughing, terrified that his distress and the lack of medication would trigger an asthma attack. I called section 4E of Children's Hospital and luckily nurse Cassie was doing a double shift. I explained Tristan's symptoms 
and she suggested we take him into the bathroom and turn on the shower as hot as possible. The steam would help ease the congestion in his lungs. So there we sat in a dark and steamy bathroom very late into our first night with baby, stroking his curly hair and patting his back until Tristan finally quieted down and fell asleep in Alma's arms. Thank you. Thank you for that extraordinary story, Alicia. And I just have to ask before we go on, how old is Tristan now? Well, he isn't with us anymore. He, we only had him for 15 months, but he would be oh. uh, this month in December uh, turning eight. Oh, okay. There are so many more chapters to that story. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you for that. And um, I'll make a shift now. Um, I'm honored to introduce our third. And sorry. I'm honored to introduce our third and final panelist for this evening, someone I admire very much and who has been a friend for a long time, Sharon Hayes. Sharon's an artist who engages multiple mediums, video, performance, and installation as ongoing investigations into specific intersections between history, politics, and speech. Her work is concerned with developing new representational strategies that examine and interrogate the present political moment as a moment that reaches simultaneously backwards and forwards a moment that is never wholly its own, but rather one that is full of multiple past moments and the speculations of multiple futures. An alumna of our MFA program here at UCLA, Sharon's work has been shown at leading venues all over the world. And she currently teaches at the University of Pennsylvania in the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Fine Arts. Welcome, welcome Sharon. Thank you, Vic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share a screen um, and begin here. Um, and uh, it's an enormous pleasure and a real um, honor to be here with all of you all and also to, to join Tyrone and Alicia um, to address this question, what is love? I, um, I yeah, already uh, there's obviously as comes with the topic a great deal of emotion that swirls around and while I am departing in some ways from where we were in many ways I'm also not and and I think of uh, where I will head as as um, also full of emotion so I invite you to bring that emotion forward and to hold both Tyrone and Alicia with us as we go. Um, I want to steer um, to or toward the question, what is love by way of a detour uh, to a related question, which is where is love? Often our first inclination is to place love uh, in the so-called personal realm, which might include family, the bedroom, the domestic, but also includes sort of individual faith, private commitments, subjective desires. When we look for love as a subject, a topic, a story, we readily find it in music, in literature, in cinema, on television, on the internet, in private correspondence, letters, emails, text messages, etc. But love also appears with robust and vibrant repetition in the streets, on protest signs, on yard signs, circulating in, with, and through the language of politics. On the protest sign, love shows up as a word. Love circulates, shifts, moves. Sometimes it appears as a proposal, sometimes a question or a demand or an assertion or a correction or a communication. 
When I started gathering images to show you today, I noticed that the word love has sharply accelerated in its appearance in protest signs over the last decade, and perhaps not surprisingly, even more so over the last four years. Love often appears in protest as a matter of fact good that opposes a matter of fact bad. Love opposes hate, power, violence, state violence, segregation, racism, Trumpism, homophobia, transphobia. Love is offered as an antidote, a reminder, a choice, a solution, a necessity, a correction, a collective agreement, a shared commitment, a win, and an environment of political belonging. Love also, importantly, opposes love itself, by which I mean love often appears on the sign uh, against incomplete, misdirected, weak, hip hypocritical, or unfulfilled versions of itself. Importantly, love also acts in these signs. Love acts with, as, through the speech act of protest. And if we look a little more closely at some of these speech acts, we gain a thicker understanding of love. By speech act, I'm referring to a theory coined in 1962 by the linguist and philosopher J.L. Austin in his book, How to Do Things with Words. Austin suggests that words not only convey and communicate information, they also perform, they act. A simple example of this is the I do of the traditional marriage ceremony. Here, the persons marrying say these two words out loud as a profession to each other. The words do not describe the promise, they perform the promise. I do is marrying. I do constitutes the act of marrying. It is not irrelevant to our discussion tonight to recognize and mark that at the time that Austin used this example in 1962, 20 US states banned marriage unions between people of different races, and queer people would have found it impossible to marry in any of the 50 states, although no legal bans existed until the 70s when gay couples in several states started trying to get married. So how does speech act? And how do our understandings of love change if we look at or work with the speech act of protest as action rather than description? as action rather than explanation, as action rather than opinion. To offer a primary observation of how speech acts in protest, I can say what you already probably know but may not think about at the top of your mind, which is that the words on the sign do not fully explain what is going on. Rather, the meaning of the speech act is produced in a triangulation, I would say, between the words on the sign, the body or bodies that hold the sign, and the place in, and time in which the sign is held. We shall win by love. If you imagine for a moment that you come across this protest sign in someone's attic storage, you wouldn't have the components with which to read it. Who is speaking, you might ask. What is being won? And what does love have to do with it? To read or hear or bear witness to the speech act, we have to hold the words on the sign with the bodies that hold them and with the time and place in which they're held. These two civil rights activists from Florida who together carry the sign embody the we. They become the slogan's bodily voice. And they also forecast to others who potentially become part of the we. Holding their sign in the context of the civil rights movement and the incredibly tenacious and challenging work to defeat Jim Crow segregation, the slogan acts as a promise that in the future, they, the sign bearers, and we who choose to join them shall win access, desegregation, racial justice, social and political transformation, because we act by love. This love is a commitment, a collective tactic, a vital component of the fierce praxis of nonviolent resistance. What Diana Nash, a founding member of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, referred to as agapic energy, drawing from the Greek word agape or love of humankind. This love does not pre-exist action. This love is action. And in this way, the speech act both names a love that mobilizes the future win and produces that love through its very naming.
contradistinction is the central operation of this very famous slogan, make love, not war. In this time and place of the protests at which this image was taken, anti-war demonstrations in the mid 1960s, the words make love, not war, make meaning in relation to two historic events, the countercultural youth movement and the Vietnam War. At that moment, make love is offered as a not quite specific, but also not yet a generic set of actions and activities that were gathering steam in youth movements across the United States in the mid to late 60s and in opposition and as opposition to its textual companion war, which at that time referred to a specific and precise war, the Vietnam War. The invitation to make love stands then as a literal call to have sex instead of going to war, but it also is a call to join others to produce love, which is also to produce new ways of being in the world, new ways of loving, new ways of having and talking about sex. What is fascinating about the speech act of protest is that it can slide fabulously across time and space. And as it does so, the original meaning amplifies, but also transforms. In this temporal drift, the specificity of the original context loosens. Both parts of the equation, make love and not war, become more generic. Love and war move away from their original and in so doing become available to link up to other <coughs> events, other collective movements. And they become therefore as words available to mean differently. As a coda, I also want to share this image of a protest that happened in the same general timescape as Make Love Not War. I found this image in a folder in the picture collection uh, at the Mid Manhattan Library in New York City. Everything else has failed. Don't you think it's time for love? I have not seen images of it circulate elsewhere. The love here is not confident or clear. It does not enthusiastically recruit. It pleads. It is doubtful. It's vulnerable. I love it. To move to a sign from our own moment and to resonate against what Tyrone spoke to. I see you, I hear you, I stand with you, I love you. I, as the I who holds the sign, love you who is not specified. You who might be marching next to me or passing by in your car or walking by me or seeing this image on the internet. The fact that this I is holding their sign in public space, in collective action, speaks from within the complex, complex, the complex collectivities of the current moment. I, as a white female presenting body, love you, the collective you, led by black and brown activists who have called me to the street by your refusal to be silent in the face of state terror. We can read or hear or witness this speech act because we have this photograph, but also because we coexist in the same relatively specific time, these times, our times, and in the same relatively specific place, i.e. places that are uprising against racism and police violence. This is an act of love, a profession of love for strangers, but not all strangers and not any strangers, but for strangers in this contingent category of vulnerability and power who are the object of the speaker's love. This act rallies language, body, and context together Love here is not offered as an abstract antidote to hate, but gathered, professed publicly, deployed tactically. I love you, and I assert this love as a political action, a political promise, a political accounting. In this sign also love is deployed, maybe even more narrowly, to interrupt and repair. This image was taken near the end of the 2018 Toronto Pride March, where, as is shockingly common, a small group of people gathered with anti-LGBTQ plus banners to hate on pride. These guys are mean and wrong. You are loved. These last three words underlined for impact. The words gather force with the body that holds them, both of which stand powerfully in between these guys who are mean and wrong and you who are loved. The act deploys love not as some vague, non-specific opposition to homophobia and transphobia, but as a specific ameliorating resistance, a contradicting force to the hate that appears in the midst of these celebrating marchers. To arrive here in queer sociology, so sociality is to recognize, again, maybe before even thinking about it, that we expect love 
to live here. Of course, here love is obviously overtly political, but why and how does love operate politically? And what can we gain by digging a little deeper into the way in which love acts in queer protests? For run months, I read the ta this tautology, love is love, on various yard signs and protest signs, often ganged together with what we might have called truisms five years ago, but that function now as badges of affiliation. I didn't realize until preparing this presentation that love is love is the statement of LGBTQ plus support. Queer love is like straight love, it means to say, or maybe that queer love, gay love, Trans love is like all love, that love is inclusive. But what we learn, particularly when these signs take to the streets, is that love is not inclusive or the speech act would not be necessary. So we learn that love is not love. Love is 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 a quotation from the acceptance speech that Lynn manuel Miranda gave at the Tony Awards June 12, 2016, the evening after the early morning massacre of mostly Latinx and black queer trans LGBT folks and allies at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Love is love was part of an outpouring of love, which is also to say an outpouring of grief that amplified in the days, weeks and months after this mass killing. This grieving love acts, it calls to and for strength, collective mourning, empathy and identification. But as the sign moves away from its mourning, what lingers is a generic equivalence that belies the critical force of difference. Lingering in the signs of gay liberation gives me an opening to see the capacity of love to move differently and differentially toward a recognition that is not dependent on inclusion or equivalence. And there, I think we might want to think about a brewing sort of Supreme Court storm that exposes the trouble with equivalence, which I'm happy to talk about later in our discussion. Dear Richard, I love you, Willie. Here, the I shows up in a name, Willie, and in body, and importantly, in gender. Willie professes love not for a stranger or for humanity, but for Richard. The speech act does not demand or recruit or forecast love. It publicly proclaims its existence. Willie's private love for Richard appears publicly in its incredible precarity and its growing power. It is private and it is public. It is personal and it is political. The speaker addresses Richard, but also another set of friends maybe those gathered on the stairs with them, or maybe even enemies passing by, collaborators perhaps who see the image 40 years later in an archive. These strangers, this extra audience, are addressed as ethical witnesses. Read this, hear this, listen to this, witness my love, and through it recognize me. These activists don't demand or they don't ask for or demand equivalence. They ask for and demand liberation. Our love exists in and as us, and we call to release it from the constraints of policing, silence, invisibility, violence, discrimination. These personal, private, political, public assertions of love don't ask for inclusion into an already existing concept of love. They challenge the very foundation of what love is and can be. They create a new script. Queer love is super. It's beautiful. It's good. It's stronger than legislation. It cannot and will not fail. And in this way, love itself will not fail. Not because we make it big enough for everyone and anyone to belong but because we set it free. Thank you. Sharon, thank you. Um, what an extraordinarily poetic analysis 
of language and particularly the language of love. And um, it doesn't escape my attention that all three of you have brought us these extraordinary presentations that are, are all through different uses of language. Um, what I wanna do now is um, bring us all together. Um, take some time to reflect on what we've just heard and seen, and for each of you to have an opportunity to respond to one another's presentations. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of the evening because you all get to talk to each other. Thank you again, each of you, for your individual presentations. You told us the beginning would be a little bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and awkward could be just fine too, right? <laughs> we have to learn a new appreciation for silence on Zoom. Um, I have a question, uh, Sharon, uh, because you had sent us the the little radio, either that, is that radio or podcast? Um, the different, the, you, know, you, you read one of them right, right now, uh, but, but what is that? Is that like a podcast that you have? The, uh, maybe you're referring to the love addresses. I think I yes. sent you, yeah, I sent you some um, excerpts from a, a, I did make a piece that I called everything else has failed. Don't you think it's time for love? Oh, okay. Um, and I made it in actually 2007 in the midst of the uh, end of the Bush years. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a, it's a love letter in essence that I speak on the street in, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's spoken to a, a you. I, I think one of the things I, I like about protest language or the language as it shows up in in public speech is is in english this shift or this way that you can move from the singular to the um plural mm -hmm. um even tyrone as you were speaking i was i was thinking that that list is so sort of capacious it's so wide because because it can hold love for all for many and love for one you know so um I've been interested in in kind of positioning um, political des political desire with you know so-called political desire with so-called personal desire, um, and and asking them to kind of circulate in space with each other because I also recognize them doing that in uh, yeah in revolutionary politics as you mentioned and in um, certainly in politics in general. Yeah, I, I just like to say thank you both, Alicia and Sharon. It's just, it's really um, ironic just the, the through lines that I saw for myself with each of you. So for hearing you, Alicia, for example, you know, a lot of the work I do now here at UCLA is around foster youth. Oh, and, really? And trying to figure out how to make that a better system. Mm -hmm. because It does not, in my humble opinion, serve children and families well. Um, some have compared it to a more of a carceral state than a supportive state. Yeah. Uh, I think the manner in which we look at how youth of color, uh, LGBTQ, youth, uh, LGBTQ plus youth have been disproportionately served well in that system. LGBTQ families, same sex families have not been served well. So I so really just appreciate just you sharing your 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 story your your family's you know journey of, of what you all did i think that's the kind of story that we need to hear more about because it takes persistence and love of course to deal with systems and structures that seemingly are designed to not even recognize our own humanity and i so appreciated the way in which you told the story and for you sharon i really appreciate the fact that i have a brief history in my life where i was a photographer and i think <laughs> Photography is just powerful, and, I, and just looking at your images, it just it just evokes so many emotions, covering the gamut um, from you know delight and satisfaction to pain and anger and sadness. And I think that's what rich photography does. And so I so appreciate your intertwining the political um, and the personal. Um, 
my question for both of you, if and and, and it's just kind of how do you how do you deal with the resistance that comes when we talk about love in the way that we did? We talked about collectively white supremacy, transphobia, homophobia, you know, um, patriarchy, uh, and there are lots of folks who 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 don't don't like to hear those references being made as it pertains to love. But I'm sure that gives us even, I'll speak for myself, that gives me greater resolve in why I do what I do. But I'm curious as to how do you all deal with the resistance that comes when you do the respective kinds of work that you do? It's a great question. Yeah, it is a really great question. Thank you so much for that. Alicia, do you want to take it first? Sure. Um, well, you know, it seems that when you're in uh, Chicano Chicano studies as a field, <laughs> then you're going to get resistance to whatever you do. And, and so that's something that, you know, you learn to deal with one way or another, uh, but also just outside of the academic environment, you know, just in everyday life and just growing up, uh, you, you're either going to give in to the, oh, good night, honey. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, that's our daughter. Um, um, you know, you're, you're always having to uh, either give in to the overwhelming sense of, you know, everybody, you know, hates me or, you know, they're just, it's just too hard. There's just too much in my way. Um, and then the other side, which is like, I'm going to take this on and I have to take this on because I know I can do it. And then this is where the whole of Cesar Chavez's, you know, famous uh, uh, saying, si se puede, you know, that Obama then turned into, yes, we can, right? Uh, it's really, that's, that's, that's the fundamental thing to know that we have the power. And, and I always tell my students, the word power in Spanish is poder, which, which signifies both power and ability, right? So we all have the ability to do whatever it is that we want to do. And, uh, and resistance is just part of the game. That's just part of what comes with the territory especially if you're involved in anything having to do with social change. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question because I do think that there's a, I think um, resistances or, or what's necessary for resistance, of course, operate really differently in different fields. And I think there's a certain kind of, it's a great privilege uh, sort of that I have as an artist and to also be sort of seen as other than, you know, other than a policymaker, other than even other than an activist in a certain way, um, where it's like, well, it's art. Um, there's a kind of leeway or a, or a willingness to um, absorb it. But that also creates another set of, of challenges, which is which is how do you also make that work um, uh, materially important, like th that it can't be in a sense dismissed or, or placed to the side. Um, and, and that the, the working around that um, is, is an ongoing effort also, I suppose, um, next to some of what I'm, I was maybe positing about liberation pro politics versus rights politics it, to, to continue to insist against a kind of absorbing, like to, to, to absorb queerness into some idea of generic normative love, rather than to really say, well, can we honor and hold what queerness may agitate about uh, normative kind of conceptions of love? Can we, can we hold that open? Can we stretch it out? Mm -hmm. How about you, Tyrone? How do you how do you deal with it? Do you do you face it in in your teaching? Do you face it in your policy work? Like where where does it sort of rub most? Keep going, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> and so to to Alicia's point, you just it's part of the it's part of the the package, and you expect it. You and and for me, in many ways, like I'm sure for each of you. It motivates me. It, it it fuels the fire. It reminds me of why I do what I do, because I feel like I've been given a platform, a privilege, an opportunity to raise issues around justice, to raise issues, raise issues around humanity, to raise issues around the dehumanization of certain bodies. That that if I don't use it, the platform that I have, be it in the policy domain, the teaching domain, the research and scholarship domain, then shame on me because too many people have died. And too many people have 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 
of sacrifice, if too many people have, have been silenced and shut down uh, for me to have this opportunity. So I feel like resistance uh, is what is to be expected. And that I also believe too, that if you're not getting resistance, are you doing the work the right way? Because when you talk about systems of oppression and trying to dismantle systems of oppression, that, that you're mm -hmm. going to evoke that kind of reaction. And the, I, I feel like the, 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 the time when I start to not get resistance, I have to wonder if I'm not doing the work the right way anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's why I love, uh, going back to what Che Guevara said, you know, that every great revolutionary or tri true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love, uh, that it's really love that pulls you through the resistance. Mm -hmm. Because you know that ultimately the reason that we do what we do is love mm -hmm. and it's love for our communities love for you know social justice uh, love for change that all matters more than you know oh this particular scrape or fight with a colleague or confrontation with a student or whatever you know thing that gets in your way ultimately behind that is love mm -hmm. you know you have to be you have to really feel what you're doing because if you don't, then you will cave in. One of the things I was thinking about in both of your presentations, um, I, I think it really hit very strongly, Alicia, in your uh, reading, in, in which, which in some ways might be described as the the sort of what what you articulated about a kind of love at first sight, like falling in love with this little boy. Yeah. And and it also it strikes me that that there is an aspect of love that is not only, um, it's not only a risk, but it's also an, an unknown. Like sometimes we fall madly, deeply in love before we have any idea what we are in love with, in a sense, who we are in love with, what we are, like what that, uh, what, what that might mean, how that might be, what, what might happen to us. Right. Um, so I, I, yeah, I wonder if you all have a thought about the kind of, unpredictable factor of it the like the leap maybe it's leap of faith or what it is that that sort of comes over um to create love where in a way w one has you know very little idea of what, maybe even the why or the I, I think it's an image that gets stuck in your brain you know like then you have to heat up the brain to get it out just I like that I like all that the notion of something getting stuck, you know. Um, uh, when I was listening to one of your uh, love addresses earlier today, Sharon, uh, it was like you were telling my story uh, in, in that in that piece where you're like, you know, here I am trying to do anything and everything possible for you to love me, and I'm willing to give up my life and give up my city and my country and and uh, and go be with you, and you're telling me no. And I'm like, hey, how does she know about my story? How does she know about that time in my life? You know, but it's really true. I mean, there are sometimes that the the person that we thought that we had fallen in love with really is just our own idea, and and it's really not the embodiment uh, that that you know we're with and that we're willing to make those sacrifices for, you know, and 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 to give up a a, a job, to give up you know a, a country to give up everything just to be with that one individual you know uh it's it's intense and that is major being stuck you know it's like oh I'm so glad i was unstuck now i think back i think oh my god if i hadn't gotten unstuck where would i be now <laughs> yeah, I think what's about that about oh yeah. sorry tyrone uh, I, I was just gonna ask you all like what's that about when that happens I, I think back to the idea of faith is, is hoping in things unseen. So I think about the fact that what love is, is really this, this, there's a blinding sort of reality to it as well, that you don't know the outcome, you don't know the ending, you don't know how this unfolds, but you believe so deeply in that thing, that person, that mission, that ideal, that you're willing to kind of go for broke, you're willing to kind of sort of lose it all because you have a faith or belief or deep-seated conviction that the outcome will be worth it, that someone will be better, 
that someone will be heard, that someone will be seen, that someone will be recognized because you feel so deeply about this, this, this thing, this idea, this concept, this person. Uh, what I really love and appreciate, just I'm thinking again about both of you is that I'm, I've been reading recently about the power and the science behind storytelling mm -hmm. and how you know, cognitive scientists are starting to look at this research now on how our brains and our hearts uh, really sort of react differently when we are listening to storytellers, that we are wired in many ways sort of physiologically and biologically to be attuned to stories. And so I'm thinking as, for example, as Alicia told her story, it draws, it drew me in because I'm holding on to every word and wanting to hear the next step and the next phase. And I don't know what's coming, but I'm, I'm, I'm there. She has me in her palm because there's a next part. And so I think there's a power in storytelling that we cannot lose because of what it does for us cognitively and psychologically, and dare I say spiritually, uh, because we find ourselves connected to those stories. We find a certain kind of humanity in those stories. We want a happy ending in those stories. We want to see people hold in those stories. And so I just, I love the fact that storytelling in all of its manifestations with Sharon's work, the storytelling is in the photos, how you snap in a moment of time, uh, a, saying, a, a saying, a phrase, an action, a behavior. So Sharon, just to age myself a little bit, I remember many years ago when I was in the photography, you know, you, we, we had these, we, it wasn't digital cameras, you take these photos and you didn't know what you had until you you took your 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 film to the to the developer and you had developed and then there was this like surprise. Okay, I think I took good photos. I think I caught good images. I think I caught you know powerful moments. But it wasn't until you saw those photos and the ones that you thought you got you might have missed. But then there were ones that you thought that weren't that great at all, and they captured some powerful sort of expressions or moments. So it's I think for me it's the it's the the unknown but it's about sort of the belief that this is something that is worth the exploration and the commitment to. Yeah, and I do think that that, I do think as you describe that, the, the faith, like the, the faith and, and that approach to the unknown, what you, um, what you risk, but what you sort of offer, it, I, I think also of showing up to a protest, even you know, showing up to a protest again, or showing up to a protest for the first time, like you come in a way ready and and also have no idea what is to come and mm -hmm. and there is something of I, I think about it with with that woman who's sort of prof, you know professing i love you like mm -hmm. like the readiness to to commit to the love um is also a kind of readiness to be the one who loves to be the one who who says i can do this i am here for this i want this no matter what may mm -hmm. come Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to shut this conversation down, not at all, not at all, but I know that um, our students and our, uh, our guests will have a lot of questions for you all. So I think we're gonna make a move. Um, we're gonna take a little break. And for the next 10 to 12 minutes, I'd like all of us to consider what you've heard about love this evening and what's most important to respond to. What are the questions that are in your mind right now? Um, and you know that you'd like to hear discussed. Um, students, you're gonna go to your small group discussion rooms. If you don't have a link, you know it's posted in the chat. And why don't you go there right now? And we'll look forward to hearing what you're thinking about. And to all our other guests, community members, friends, faculty, colleagues, we invite you to stay put right where you are because you're in for another treat. It brings me great pleasure to once again share the screen with my colleague, Kevin Kane, the Director of Visual and Performing Arts Education Program, an academic minor in our school and an extraordinary connector to Los Angeles schools. Kevin is gonna provide a little background about our special partnership with 11th and 12th grade students from John Marshall High School. And I'll be seeing you later. Kevin, welcome again, the screen is yours. Thank you, thank you, Vic. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as Vic said, I'm Kevin Kane. I'm the director of UCLA's Visual and Performing Arts Education Program, otherwise known as VAPA. Um, for those joining for the first time, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our very special partnership with the 10 Questions class. Um, this year to expand 10 Questions reach deeper into the community, 
we've invited middle and high school students from five Los Angeles public schools representing five different arts disciplines and grades to engage in the program and engage with the questions. Each cohort of students has been invited to have their own classroom conversations, create art in response to one of the 10 questions that was assigned to them. We share the work that they create with our faculty panelists um, and, as, and also the UCLA students who are enrolled in this class. And then on Monday evenings, we share that work with you, the public um, and our guests. If you've been following along this quarter, you've had a chance to see some amazing work from extraordinary students across LA as they've engaged with 10 Questions program. We've witnessed the visual art students from the UCLA Community School reflect on the question, what is justice? 10th grade theater art students from the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts um, use theater to answer the question, what is power? Seventh and eighth grade dance students from Marina Del, like, sorry, Marina Del Rey Middle School answered what is hope in a beautiful way. And the students from Venice High School Media Arts Program used photography to grapple with the, the query, what is resilience? But tonight for our final installment of our partnership, it brings me great pleasure to share musical works, the fifth art form music created by students in grades nine through 12 from John Marshall High School in response to what is love. Um, this week's participants are enrolled in a music songwriting course with Mr. Mike Finn, a veteran music and special ed teacher at Marshall in a historic school in um, Los, Los Feliz area, neighborhood of LA. Um, the class is an arts ed elective. Um, of course, it's been offered uh, remotely this semester. Um, and as you probably know, um, that, that remote teaching and learning started last spring. So it's been quite a haul for teachers and students. Not all the students in the class um, necessarily identify as musicians or songwriters. Not all of them enrolled in the, in the class this semester even had instruments in their home. Um, in order to help them learn about songwriting. Um, though they are clearly poets and artists, um, as you'll see. Um, you'll also see they clearly have a lot of profound things to say about uh, tonight's question of love. I should also note that Mr. Finn's songwriting class is one of the few that's offered within a non-magnet, non-arts magnet within LAUSD. So I, I give a lot of credit to Marshall High School and Mr. Finn for um, imagining their students who aren't necessarily deeply um, engaged as artists, but still recognizing their creativity and their artistic potential um, to share and write and create a song. But you'll see that um, Mr. Finn and his students really tapped into their creativity and their shared love of music to discover innovative ways to make music together, even though they weren't actually together. They did it mostly from my understanding on their computers, um, various, ver various songwriting um, apps and programs that are available. I think they taught each other. Uh, from Mr. Finn's perspective, his students taught him as much as he taught them. Um, they worked from various workspaces, including bedrooms and living rooms, hallways and kitchens. Um, You'll also see the school as it is uh, in the video collage we're gonna show uh, as it's been for the past nine months. What normally would be a bustling urban high school reverberating with the sound of students' voices and songs remains empty and silent, but the music they made in their homes echoes loud and clear. Um, I think tonight's video collage is as much about creative process and community as it is about musical product. Um, the songs they wrote are really quite beautiful, um, but I think there's the uh, uh, an undercurrent of something else that's going on here that's equally important as the music they wrote. Mr. Finn describes this as, um, he describes this to his students. This is the what is love song, but as far as I'm concerned, any song you wrote this semester is evidence that love exists in the universe. Uh, beautiful and true, Mr. Finn further reflects on his students' creative process. Um, I think recognizes the ubiquitous idea of love in music, maybe especially in pop songs, but also a glimpse into his strategy for teaching songwriting when he tells his students, I usually tell my students to write a song about anything but love, and I can hear the kids relax. And then do you know what they do? They write a song about love. 
So what is love? Mr. Finn asks, I don't know. But through this project, I've been a witness to an extraordinary amount of love. Love of music, love of expression, love for innovation, love for each other. If you ask me, I think creativity and art and sticking together through the toughest of times, this is love. Thank you, Mr. Finn. Thank you to Marshall students, um, all of whom are in the webinar tonight. I hope you enjoy what they've created. Hi, my name's Mike Finn, and for the last 15 years or so, I've taught a songwriting class at John Marshall High School. On the question of what is it like to be a music educator in the time of pandemic and online uh, instruction, I can't really answer that. You know, the songwriting is, certainly there's a musical component of it, uh, and there's certainly a lyrical component of it. And so I always tell language arts teachers, you know, it's not just like coming up with, with, with writing lyrics. And I'll tell the music department, well, you know, it's not just one, four, five chords. Um, however, historically, yeah, I was able to um, support, uh, uh, especially a guitarist with developing skills. I could support him or her over the course of the uh, semester. That's really challenging to do now. reaction in the brain that evolved as a survival instinct that compels living beings to form community. The magic of the school comes from, uh, from the students that, that attend the school and, and the faculty that teach those students. And, but for whatever reason, there's still a little bit of energy left in those bricks, despite the fact that there's no, there's no, there's no students. As I said earlier, they show up, almost all of them, every day. And 
nothing would happen without that occurring. And so with that happening, I do feel like, um, like that's the biggest challenge to overcome. If they show up, hey man, we're gonna, we're gonna get you something. It's not gonna be what, maybe what everybody's used to, but we're gonna get you some education and we're gonna, um, we're gonna build some community. Loving is a terrible thing It only ever caused me pain It only ever caused me My name is Jordan Weiss, and I think love is when you're willing to make a sacrifice. How's it going on the other side of the world? Been a minute since we spoke. You told me to count on my hands every time I got nervous. But you're gone, and it seems pointless to carry on. I'm going to say that love is creativity. Um, I don't really think we can create unless we're capable of love. And for me, this semester, witnessing what I've witnessed from these 30 kids who, under the most difficult of, of environments, the most difficult situations, they have time and again um, so impressed me and uh, uh, just amazing the amount of creativity that they can come up with listen to what they come up with if that's not love right if that's not love My room is a wonderful place, always there when I'm happy or sad. My room is a place of comfort, my appreciation will never end. The only thing that's similar to my room is my family. Listen to me. Welcome back, everyone. We've already had a number of questions um, populating a chat, and I, um, I, do we have Alicia yet? I think she'll be here in a moment. Um, so, a basic question for you all is: What, who, and wh who, and what would we be without love? <laughs> Basic. Uh, you're you're laughing there, Sharon. Why don't you take that away? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question, and um, I I mean I think that we I think Tyrone sort of laid it out really well at the beginning how much of our being, how much of our social being, how much of our personal being, how much of our believing, you know, our ourself as believers is um held by love and held with love so um i i can't i can't imagine uh i can't imagine our beingness our collective beingness without it um it's beyond my my vision yeah i i i, I want to build on sharon's point i think um it's hard for me to to really wrap my head around what i would be without love and i'm reminded of how in the field of psychology there is the the, the concept around attachment theory and I'm not a psychology expert or a psychology professor, but I know enough about it to say that, to, to know that it talks about the formative years without any kind of real emotional bond, typically between a parent and a, and a newborn child, is really, really critical for the overall development in life in every other way, shape, or form. So when we sadly see some people in our society who do these horrific things, there's often time a trace back to their childhood and it shows that that attachment, that love, that deep emotional bond 
was either not there or inconsistent or, or, or not reliable. So when we don't have love, I think sadly and tragically, we have examples in our midst of what happened. And I think this is where Alicia's uh, storytelling was so powerful in terms of you know, what she encountered in the foster care system when there were young people who did not have love and, and, and how the, the, the life chances are so challenging, so daunting. Mm -hmm. Well, related to that, a question has come in. How do you think love and loss connect mm -hmm. together? What is their relationship to one another? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, can I jump in there? I think, uh, you know, loss to me is a very uh, important theme in my writing, in my, uh, in my books and novels and poetry and stuff. And it co directly connects to a legend, uh, the Mexican legend of La Llorona, the weeping woman, who wanders uh, the streets and causeways, uh, you know, of, of our of our of our history and of our and of our community, uh, crying out for her lost children. And and that image, that myth, has always haunted me. And she's become of late very popular. I mean, even in, uh, in England, I, I got a call from the BBC that are doing a, 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 a thing on ghost stories, and they wanted to interview me about this Yorona. And then, you know, there's the movies and the, the, there's just so much going on right now around this, this uh, weeping woman, who is the primordial, you know, symbol of loss. Uh, and and the story is 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 not is not a nice one because it's said that supposedly she drowned her own children, uh, and and uh, and then uh, went and then killed herself, and of course is not led back into heaven until she finds their their souls uh, and and redeems herself, uh, which is a is a very ugly I think telling of of that particular sense of of the loss of your children. Uh, for whatever the reason is that you may have lost them. And I think that I don't, I don't think that you would be a wandering spirit through time if you did not, had not loved your children. And I don't think that if you really love your children, you would be able to like uh, do any damage to them, let alone drown them. Uh, and one of the things that I think I'm, I've learned uh, through this whole experience with the foster system is that this whole notion of parental love and how and, and maternal love, just because somebody is your parent that they automatically love you, how untrue that really is. Because it's not true of everybody who has children. And, and, and that, that's one of the things that I also think of as, as, a very, as a very sad kind of reality, but a reality nonetheless, that we just can't take this love for granted that it's not just a given. I mean, one, one, thing, one thing I guess I, I also want to add a little to the side of what Alicia is, is, is raising is that um, I think in terms of political inhabitation, love also often is given as the good to the side of the bad, which, is, which ignores some of what Tyrone and Alicia both brought about which is the constant state of loss. There's also a constant state of loss. To love is to lose. Mm -hmm. To love is to be disappointed. To lo love is to be in pain. And I think that there is something to learn from that mm -hmm. pain, that side of love, uh, that there's an opening, a whole set of openings that help us, help us, that, that do nourish mm -hmm. us as well, as painful as they are. Related to that, um, thank you both for that. Um, this is a really beautiful question. I'm going to read it and um, we might shape it. In what ways do you think love has become a more challenging and confusing space for our generation? And by that, I think we is coming from our students. What factors, factors do you think have contributed to this um, lack of love or, or the challenges of love, if you see it that way? So looking at this new generation, um, <coughs> the challenges um, and of love. I don't want to sound like the, the old person here, but dare I say social media has really transformed in this <coughs> generation. We can create an image of ourselves that may not be authentic. We can create a reality that may not be authentic. 
uh, we can create a set of circumstances that are not authentic. And so therefore I think it's hard to love that which is not real. It's hard to love that which is not, um, is not uh, authentic. And I think we also are a byproduct of an immediate gratification society. If I can't have it right away, if it doesn't happen in one minute, is it worth waiting for? And I would say love takes time. Love is enduring. Love is patience. Love is perseverance. And that doesn't mean that this generation cannot capture it. I just think it's got to figure out how it sort of unfolds itself in this sort of minute, in this moment of me, this moment of now, this moment of sort of alter realities. Uh, that are not always steeped in truth. I, I mean, I also, I also think, uh, yeah, because I teach as well, and and um, I really appreciate you all, you students, and and you also have to help us understand that because because I totally agree that um, in a way it's like it must be social media. But but you live in that kind of um, native native space, and and in that way, I think you we need you to to help us understand because also your generation brings so much rich experience with um, loving in a totally different gendered you know gendered environment than than I than I existed in in, in my twenties, and and that also changes love it changes how we think of love so there are so many things that you all live uh in a in a daily and and um enveloped way that that we need you to help us understand that we need you to help all of us kind of um articulate that new newness here's a here's a great question and it may end up being our last question of the night time just keeps slipping. Um, why don't we talk and teach more about love and loving relationships in school? Mm. Should we? I think so. I mean, I really want to echo what Tyrone said right at the beginning of his talk, that a, co a course like this really should be mandatory. It should be one of those requirements, you know, just for like, uh, for, for, for humanity, for, for the humaneness, you know, in, in everybody. It's so easy to uh, get so caught up in all the other demands of, of the university and, and demands of the job and of everything else. And then you, you know, you lose your humaneness, you lose that, that core. Um, so I do think that there should be many more courses like this uh, and, and, and or courses in which love is considered a real, authentic, uh, generative topic uh, capable of producing uh, science and research and uh, new ideas and whatever it is that, you know, the university wants uh, students to, to get from their education and students want to get from their education. I, I really believe that. Storytelling is, is, you know, absolutely central to that. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, and um, okay, I think we can squeeze in another one here. This is uh, specifically inspired by Tyrone's talk. Um, how do we find the boundary and balance between, and anyone can answer, between self-sacrifice for others and self-care? Mm. How do you manage? That's an excellent boundary? question. Uh, that's an excellent, I'll defer to one of my <laughs> esteemed co-panelists, Sharon, Alicia. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's yeah it, it is the hard it is the hard work and I think we I think we all come to it differently we're not on neutral ground you know there's a whole host of people pandemic exposes it super clearly there are a whole host of people burdened with uh care for others um and that that lays that lays that burden down um really strongly and and squarely on their shoulders and so I think um I think in a way, maybe one of the things I would say about your question, which is so important, is to is that we think of this as something like, how do I manage this balance? How do I manage this boundary? But in fact, we also have to work. I, I was thinking that in terms of teaching, too, we also have to work institutionally. We ha also have to work um, civically to help 
our our community's balance. It's it's not just you being left on your own to figure out how much do I give here uh, and how much and where do I where do I find time? Where do I find resources to take care of myself? You need resources to take care of yourself. You need resources for the people you're taking care of in order to take care of them and yourself. Um, so I think I do think it's collective, and I think this moment has surfaced a lot of you know, resurfaced a lot of good structures um, that I think, you know, mutual aid and, and other other ways of looking at care. I, I have to say one of the things that was such a blessing as I arrived out on the streets to protest in August into September was to see people with carts with masks and snacks and water and like, you know, wash for the eyes like in my days in the in the 90s or even the early 2000s or the mid 2000s there wasn't like a whole care team out on the streets you know c covering the protesters um yeah. that was amazing that was amazing yeah and I, I would like to do a shout out to the millennial generation because i think it's this generation that has really taken seriously the notion of self-care uh, where they tell each other to self-care, where self-care is absolutely vital to their existence. I remember when my first students started to say this thing about self-care and I would laugh at them. I would say, oh yeah, right. And you want to be an academic and you want to get involved in self-care? I mean, that, there's a conflict of interest right there uh, because that's my life as an academic and continues to be my life, you know? Self-care is off the table. I've got to meet all my deadlines. I've got to prepare my lectures, grade my papers, uh, go get my baby from preschool. You know, I've got to do things, right? Uh, but the self-care stuff is so absolutely central. And I and that's what the millennial generation, that's one of the gifts that you all are giving to us. So that's, mm. I, I thank you for that. I agree. Mm. I agree. Mm. I think you're sending love right out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so we are, actually over time, but I want to invite each of you to um, say whatever last words you'd like to say, whatever that might be. Don't give up on love. Don't give up on love. Please don't give up on love. It's a, it's a, it's a been a pleasure to be a part of this. And, and I, yeah, I also feel like, um, more like more love more time to talk about love more time to talk with each other about love more time to account for it um and to account with each other uh, for how it how it um nourishes us um i want to thank you vic and and your whole team uh for creating a space mm -hmm. on campus in which you can not only talk about love but see it in action and give everybody some room in which to actually understand how important love is. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Tyrone. And thank you, Sharon. I hate that these evenings come to an end and this one particularly. Um, this concludes this evening's program. We hope you'll join us again next week for the final offering of this year's 10 questions, Reckoning. And the question next week is, what matters? Mm -hmm. Same time, new link. And to learn more about the entire series, to listen to recordings of previous weeks, or to RSVP for our final session, um, please visit arts.ucla.edu backslash 10 questions. Thank you. And until next week, good night.